The Ogaden War, or the Etio-Somali War, was a military conflict fought between Somalia and Ethiopia from July 1977 to March 1978 over the Ethiopian region of Ogaden. The conflict began with the Somali invasion of Ethiopia. The Soviet Union disapproved of the invasion and ceased its support of Somalia, instead starting to support Ethiopia. Ethiopia was saved from defeat and permanent loss of territory through a massive airlift of military supplies worth $1 billion, the arrival of more than 12,000 Cuban soldiers and airmen sent by Fidel Castro to win a second African victory, and 1,500 Soviet advisors, led by General Vasily Petrov. On 23 January 1978, Cuban armored brigades inflicted the worst losses the Somali forces had ever taken in a single action since the start of the war. The Ethiopians and Cubans prevailed at Hara, Diadora, and Jijiga, and began to push the Somalis systematically out of the Ogaden. By 23 March 1978, the Ethiopians and Cubans had recaptured more than two-thirds of the Ogaden, marking the official end of the war. A third of the Somali National Army was killed, and half of the Somali Air Force destroyed, the war left Somalia with a disorganized and demoralized army, and an angry population. All of these conditions led to a revolt in the army which eventually spiraled into a civil war. Chapter 1 – Background Chapter 1 – Section 1 – Territorial Partition Following World War II, Britain retained control of both British Somaliland, and Italian Somaliland as protectorates. In 1950, as a result of the Paris Peace Treaties, the United Nations granted Italy trusteeship of Italian Somaliland, but only under close supervision and on the condition, first proposed by the Somali Youth League, and other nascent Somali political organizations, such as Heisbia Digil Mirifal Somali and the Somali National League that Somalia achieve independence within ten years. British Somaliland remained a protectorate of Britain until 1960. In 1948, under pressure from their World War II allies and to the dismay of the Somalis, the British returned the Houd and the Ogaden to Ethiopia, based on a treaty they signed in 1897 in which the British, French and Italians agreed upon the territorial boundaries of Ethiopia with the Ethiopian Emperor Menelik in exchange for his help against raids by hostile clans. Britain included the provision that the Somali residents would retain their autonomy, but Ethiopia immediately claimed sovereignty over the area. This prompted an unsuccessful bid by Britain in 1956 to buy back the Somali lands it had turned over. Britain also granted administration of the almost exclusively Somali-inhabited northern frontier district to Kenyan nationalists despite an informal plebiscite demonstrating the overwhelming desire of the region's population to join the newly formed Somali Republic. A referendum was held in neighboring Djibouti in 1958, on the eve of Somalia's independence in 1960, to decide whether or not to join the Somali Republic or to remain with France. The referendum turned out in favor of a continued association with France, largely due to a combined yes vote by the sizable Afar ethnic group and resident Europeans. There was also widespread vote rigging, with the French expelling thousands of Somalis before the referendum reached the polls. The majority of those who voted no were Somalis who were strongly in favor of joining a united Somalia, as had been proposed by Mahmoud Harbi, vice president of the government council. Harbi was killed in a plane crash two years later. Djibouti finally gained its independence from France in 1977, and Hassan Gould Aptiden, who had campaigned for a yes vote in the referendum of 1958, eventually wound up as Djibouti's first president. British Somaliland became independent on 26 June 1960 as the state of Somaliland and the trust territory of Somalia followed suit five days later. On 1 July 1960, the two territories united to form the Somali Republic. A government was formed by Abdullahi Issa and other members of the trusteeship and protectorate governments, with Haji Bashir Ismail Yusuf as president of the Somali National Assembly, Aden Abdullah Osman Dar as president of the Somali Republic and Abdurashid Ali Shermak as prime minister. On 20 July 1961, through a popular referendum, 
the people of Somalia ratified a new constitution that had been first drafted the previous year. On 15 October 1969, while paying a visit to the northern town of Las Anad, Somalia's then President Shermark was shot dead by one of his own bodyguards. His assassination was quickly followed by a military coup d'etat on 21 October 1969, in which the Somali army seized power without encountering armed opposition, essentially a bloodless takeover. The coup was spearheaded by Major General Mohamed Syed Bar, who at the time commanded the army. Chapter 1 Section 2 Supreme Revolutionary Council Alongside Bar, the Supreme Revolutionary Council that assumed power after President Sharmak's assassination was led by Lieutenant Colonel Salaid Gebaya Kejie, and Chief of Police Jama Kushal. Kejie officially held the title of Father of the Revolution, and Bar shortly afterwards became the head of the SRC. The SRC subsequently renamed the country the Somali Democratic Republic, dissolved the Parliament and the Supreme Court, and suspended the Constitution. In addition to previous Soviet funding and arms support to Somalia, Egypt sent millions of dollars in arms to Somalia. Chapter 1 Section 3 Somali National Army Plan Under the leadership of General Mohamed Ali Samatar, Iro and other senior Somali military officials were mandated in 1977 with formulating a national strategy in preparation for the Ogaden campaign in Ethiopia. This was part of a broader effort to unite all of the Somali inhabited territories in the Horn region into a greater Somalia. A distinguished graduate of the Soviet Frunza Military Academy, Samantha oversaw Somalia's military strategy. In the late 1970s, Samatar was the chief commanding officer of the Somali National Army during the Ogaden campaign. He and his frontline deputies faced off against their mentor and former Frunza alumnus, General Vasily Ivanovich Petrov, who was assigned by the USSR to advise the Ethiopian army, in addition to 15,000 Cuban troops supporting Ethiopia, led by General Arnoldo Ochoa. General Samatar was assisted in the offensive by several field commanders, most of whom were also Frunza graduates. General Yusuf Salhan commanded SNA on the Jijiga front, assisted by Colonel A. Naji, capturing the area on August 30, 1977. Colonel Abdullahi Yusuf Ahmed commanded SNA on the Nigeli front. Colonel Abdullahi Ahmed Iro commanded SNA on the Godi front. Colonel Ali Hussein commanded SNA in two fronts, Kabri Dahari and Hara. Colonel Farah Handel commanded SNA on the Warder Front. General Mohammed Nurgalal assisted by Col. Mahmoud SH. Abdullahi Jilkad commanded Der Dewa. The SNA retreated from Der Dewa. Colonel Abdul Rahman R.A. and Colonel Ali Ismail co commanded the Degeba Front. Colonel Abakar Le Bonaftuye initially served as acting logistics coordinator for the Southern Command and later commanded the SNA on the EMI front. Chapter 1 Section 4 Somali Air Force The Somali Air Force was mainly formed in the Soviet manner, with the officer corps being trained in the USSR. Somali Air Force Operational Aircraft Chapter 1 Section 5 Derg in September 1974, Emperor Haile Selassie had been overthrown by the Derg, marking a period of turmoil. The Derg quickly fell into internal conflict to determine who would have primacy. Meanwhile, various anti-Derg as well as separatist movements began throughout the country. One of the separatist groups seeking to take advantage of the chaos was the pro-Somalia Western Somali Liberation Front operating in the Somali-inhabited Ogaden, which by late 1975 had struck numerous government outposts. WSLF had control of most of the Ogaden, the first time since the Second World War that all Somalia was united with the exception of the NFD region in Kenya. The victory in Ogaden was mostly because of support from the Harari populace who had aligned with the WSLF. From 1976 to 1977, Somalia supplied arms and other aid to the WSLF. Opposition to the reign of the Derg was the main cause of the Ethiopian civil war. 
This conflict began as extra-legal violence between 1975 and 1977, known as the Red Terror, when the Derg struggled for authority, first with various opposition groups within the country, then with a variety of groups jockeying for the role of Vanguard Party. Though human rights violations were committed by all sides, the great majority of abuses against civilians as well as actions leading to devastating famine were committed by the government. A sign that order had been restored among the Derg was the announcement of Mengistu Haile Mariam, as head of state on February 11, 1977. However, the country remained in chaos as the military attempted to suppress its civilian opponents in a period known as the Red Terror. Despite the violence, the Soviet Union, which had been closely observing developments, came to believe that Ethiopia was developing into a genuine Marxist-Leninist state, and that it was in Soviet interests to aid the new regime. They thus secretly approached Mengistu with offers of aid that he accepted. Ethiopia closed the U.S. military mission, and the communications center in April 1977. In June 1977, Mengistu accused Somalia of infiltrating SNA soldiers into the Somali area to fight alongside the WSLF. Despite considerable evidence to the contrary, Barr strongly denied this, saying SNA volunteers were being allowed to help the WSLF. Chapter 1 Section 6 Ethiopian Air Force the Ethiopian Air Force was formed by British and Swedish aid, during the 1940s and 50s, later receiving plenty of US support since the 60s. Despite being small, it was an elite force, consisting of hand-picked officers and intensive training program for airmen at home and abroad. The Ethiopian Air Force benefited from a US Air Force aid program. A team of U.S. Air Force officers and NCOs assessed the force and provided recommendations as part of the Military Advisory and Assistance Group. The Ethiopian Air Force was restructured as the U.S.-style organization. Emphasis was given to training institutions. Ethiopian personnel were sent to the U.S. for training, including 25 Ethiopian pilots for jet training, and many more were trained locally by U.S. defense personnel. Prior of 1974, the Ethiopian Air Force mainly consisted in a dozen of F-86 Sabres and a dozen of F-5A Freedom Fighters. In 1974, Ethiopia requested the delivery of McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom Fighters, but U.S. offered 16 Northrop F-5E Tiger IIs instead, armed with AIM-9 Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles as well as two Westinghouse and slash TPS-43D radars, one of them was later placed at Gijiga. Due to human rights violations in the country, only eight F-5E Tiger IIs were delivered in 1976 by the U.S. Ethiopian Air Force Operational Aircraft Chapter 1 Section 7 Castro Trip to Aden when the Cubans and the Soviets learned of the Somali plans to annex the Ogaden, Castro flew to Aden in March 1977 where he suggested an Ethiopian-Somali-Yemeni Socialist Federation. Castro's plan didn't get any support and two months later Somali forces attacked the Ethiopians. Cuba, supported by troops from the USSR and South Yemen, sided with Ethiopia. Chapter 2 Course of the War Chapter 2 Section 1, Somali Invasion on Ethiopian Ogaden The Somali National Army committed to invade the Ogaden on July 12, 1977, according to Ethiopian Ministry of National Defense documents. According to Ethiopian sources, the invaders numbered 70,000 troops, 40 fighter planes, 250 tanks, 350 APCs, and 600 artillery, which would have meant practically the whole Somali army. Soviet officials put the number of attacking Somali forces at 23,000 servicemen, 150 T-34 and 50 T-54-55 tanks, as well as 250 armored personnel carriers like BTR-50 pack, BTR-152 and BTR-60 petabytes. In addition to the Somali regular troops another 15,000 fighters of the WSLF were also present in the Ogaden. By the end of the month 60% of the Ogaden had been taken by the SNA WSLF force, including Goad, on the Shebel River. The attacking forces did suffer some early setbacks, 
Ethiopian defenders at Diador and Gijiga inflicted heavy casualties on assaulting forces. The Ethiopian Air Force also began to establish air superiority using its Northrop F-5s, despite being initially outnumbered by Somali MiG-21s. However, Somalia was easily overpowering Ethiopian military hardware and technology capability. Soviet General Vasily Petrov had to report back to Moscow the sorry state of the Ethiopian army. The 3rd and 4th Ethiopian infantry divisions that suffered the brunt of the Somali invasion had practically ceased to exist. The USSR, finding itself supplying both sides of a war, attempted to mediate a ceasefire. When their efforts failed, the Soviets abandoned Somalia. All aid to Syed Bar's regime was halted, while arms shipments to Ethiopia were increased. A Soviet military airlift with advisors for Ethiopia took place alongside 15,000 Cuban combat troops in a military role. Other communist countries like the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen and North Korea offered military assistance. East Germany likewise offered training, engineering and support troops. In November 1977, Somalia broke diplomatic relations with the USSR, expelled all Soviet experts from the country, abrogated the 1974 Treaty of Friendship and cut off diplomatic relations with Cuba. Not all communist states sided with Ethiopia. Because of the Sino-Soviet rivalry, China supported Somalia diplomatically and with token military aid. Romania under Nicolae Ceausescu had a habit of breaking with Soviet policies and maintained good diplomatic relations with Syed Bar. By 17 August elements of the Somali army had reached the outskirts of the strategic city of Diador. Not only was the country's second-largest military airbase located here, as well as Ethiopia's crossroads into the Ogaden, but Ethiopia's rail lifeline to the Red Sea ran through this city, and if the Somalis held Diador, Ethiopia would be unable to export its crops or bring in equipment needed to continue the fight. Gebratarik estimates the Somalis advanced with two motorized brigades, one tank battalion and one BM battery upon the city, against them were the Ethiopian 2nd Militia Division, the 201 Nebelbal Battalion, 781 Battalion of the 78th Brigade, the 4th Mechanized Company, and a tank platoon possessing two tanks. The fighting was vicious as both sides knew what the stakes were, but after two days, Despite that the Somalis had gained possession of the airport at one point, the Ethiopians had repulsed the assault, forcing the Somalis to withdraw. Henceforth this became known as the Battle of Diador, and the city was never again at risk of attack. Chapter 2 Section 2 – Somali Victories and Siege of Hara The greatest single victory of the SNAWSLF was the assault on Gijiga in mid-September, in which the demoralized Ethiopian troops withdrew from the town. The local defenders were no match for the assaulting Somalis and the Ethiopian military was forced to withdraw past the strategic strongpoint of the Marda Pass, halfway between Gijiga and Hara. By September Ethiopia was forced to admit that it controlled only about 10% of the Ogaden and that the Ethiopian defenders had been pushed back into the non-Somali areas of Harj, Bale, and Sidamo. However, the Somalis were unable to press their advantage because of the high attrition on its tank battalions, constant Ethiopian air attacks on their supply lines, and the onset of the rainy season which made the dirt roads unusable. During that time, the Ethiopian government managed to raise and train a giant militia force 100,000 strong and integrated it into the regular fighting force. Also, since the Ethiopian army was a client of U.S. weapons, hasty acclimatization to the new Warsaw Pact block weaponry took place. From October 1977 until January 1978, the SNAWSLF forces attempted to capture Hara during the Battle of Hara, where 40,000 Ethiopians had regrouped and rearmed with Soviet-supplied artillery and armor, backed by 1,500 Soviet advisors and 16,000 Cuban soldiers, they engaged the attackers in vicious fighting. Though the Somali forces reached the city outskirts by November, they were too exhausted to take the city and eventually had to withdraw to await the Ethiopian counterattack. Casualties among the Somalis may have totaled as many as 40,000 since the start of the war. 
Chapter 2 Section 3, Ethiopian-Cuban Counterattack The expected Ethiopian-Cuban attack occurred in early February, however, it was accompanied by a second attack that the Somalis did not expect. A column of Ethiopian and Cuban troops crossed northeast into the highlands between Jijiga, and the border with Somalia, bypassing the SNAWSLF force defending the Marder Pass. Soviet Milmi 6 and Milmi 8 helicopters airlifted a Cuban battalion behind enemy lines. The attackers were thus able to assault from two directions in a pincer movement, allowing the recapture of Jijiga in only two days while inflicting 3,000 to 6,000 casualties on the Somalis. The Somali defense collapsed and every major Somali-occupied town was recaptured in the following weeks. The Somalis took a terrible beating from Cuban artillery and aerial assaults. Recognizing that his position was untenable, Syed Bar ordered the SNA to retreat back into Somalia on 9 March 1978, although René Lafort claims that the Somalis, having foreseen the inevitable, had already withdrawn their heavy weapons. The last significant Somali unit left Ethiopia on 15 March 1978, marking the end of the war. Chapter 3, Effects of the War The executing of civilians and refugees, and rape of women by the Ethiopian and Cuban troops was prevalent throughout the war. A large Cuban contingent remained in Ethiopia after the war to protect the socialist government. Assisted by Soviet advisers, the Cuban contingent launched a second offensive in December 1979 directed at the population's means of survival, including the poisoning and destruction of wells and the killing of cattle herds. Following the withdrawal of the SNA the WSLF continued their insurgency. By May 1980, the rebels, with the assistance of a small number of SNA soldiers who continued to help the guerrilla war, controlled a substantial region of the Ogaden. However, by 1981 the insurgents were reduced to sporadic hit-and-run attacks and were finally defeated. In addition, the WSLF and SORF were significantly weakened after the Ogaden War. The former was practically defunct by the late 1980s, with its splinter group, the Ogaden National Liberation Front operating from headquarters in Kuwait. Even though elements of the ONLF would later manage to slip back into the Ogaden, their actions had little impact. For the Ba'a regime, the invasion was perhaps the greatest strategic blunder since independence, and it weakened the military. Almost one third of the regular SNA soldiers, three eighths of the armored units, and half of the Somali Air Force were lost. The weakness of the Ba'a administration led it to effectively abandon the dream of a unified Greater Somalia. The failure of the war aggravated discontent with the Ba'a regime. The first organized opposition group, the Somali Salvation Democratic Front, was formed by army officers in 1979. The United States adopted Somalia as a Cold War ally from the late 1970s to 1988s in exchange for use of Somali bases, and a way to exert influence upon the region. A second armed clash in 1988 was resolved, when the two countries agreed to withdraw their militaries from the border.